Hello everyone and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video we're going to be looking at a skills um, set which is looking at the risk factors of lung disease and the data associated with that. So all of the things we're going to go through today you don't need to know on the AQA specification but it's all in the extra bit where it says students should be able to interpret information or data on these topics. So you're expected to be familiar with them, or if AQA were to give you a paragraph of information or a graph, you could apply your knowledge to that. So this is a bit of practice. So first thing is a spirometer. You could have questions linked to data produced by a spirometer. And this is how the lung capacity is measured. So we can see here that a patient has to take a deep breath and blow out as hard as possible just through their mouth. They've got a nose clip on to make sure no air can enter or escape through the nose because that then won't be collected and measured by the machine. Um, the technicians there just monitoring. So the type of graph that you would get from this is this here. So you'd breathe in and out normally and this would give you the tidal volume. So you can see it would be breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, normally at rest. You could be asked as well to take as big a breath in and exhale as possible. And that would then be this line here on the graph. Now, there's lots of other pieces of information here that you can see on the graph. The key things are, and again, this isn't on the spec, you need to know it. It's you would need to understand it if you were shown the information. So tidal volume is the at rest or normal breathing rate, um, breathing volume, sorry. And it would be typically 0.5 decimeters cubed. Decimeters cubed is same as a litre, so half a litre is the normal volume of air you would inhale and exhale at rest. The vital capacity then, which is indicated um, over here, this block, which is from 6,000 down to about 8, um, so 1,200 here, that is the maximum volume of air you can inhale and exhale. So that would be when they were doing the largest inhale and exhale they possibly could. Residual volume. Now this is the volume of air that permanently stays in your lungs. So your lungs never completely empty of air. Because if they did, it would all start to stick together and then it'd be really hard to inflate your lungs again. So you always have a residual amount of um, air in your lungs to make sure they do stay um, inflated. The total lung capacity then is looking at um, your vital capacity plus the residual. And most people's total lung capacity, so the total volume of air that you can hold, is between five and six litres or five and six decimeters cubed. Now you wouldn't be asked to label any of that. You're more likely to get information where you look at a healthy person's spirometer trace compared to someone with a disease. And we'll come to that shortly. So there is a calculation linked to this, and this is specified that you do need to know it. So pulmonary ventilation, this is the total volume of air that moves in and out of the lungs in one minute. So decimeters cubed is the unit for volume and it's per minute. So to work this out, you would need to know the tidal volume, which was the at rest volume entering and exiting the lungs, and how quickly you're breathing, so the ventilation rate, and that is breaths per minute. Multiply them together, and that gives you the pulmonary ventilation. It could be linked to algebra as well, though, so you might have to rearrange the formula. So you might be given the spirometer trace graph, or you might be given data on an individual's pulmonary ventilation or maybe tidal volume, and that could then be linked to certain lung diseases. Again, you don't need to know about any of these diseases. It would be an application question. So the diseases that used to be on the spec got taken off was pulmonary fibrosis, asthma and emphysema. Um, but you might also have questions maybe linked to bronchitis. You could be given information and have to apply your knowledge to explain why it would affect either ventilation or gas exchange. 
So I've just included some images for you to have a go at applying that knowledge. So we can see here the bronchial tube of a healthy individual versus the bronchial tube of someone with bronchitis. Now this looks very similar to an asthmatic. So we can see here again the bronchioles of a healthy person compared to the bronchioles of an asthmatic individual. The key thing that you can see here, you could be asked why would this decrease gas exchange? And what we can see here is you've got a narrowing of the lumen because of inflammation. So the inflamed tissue has resulted in a much smaller lumen. So therefore you'll have less air entering the alveoli and less air exiting. So you won't have as large a concentration gradient and you won't be getting enough oxygen delivered to the alveoli for gas exchange. The other two we can see here, um, we've got the normal alveoli of a healthy person compared to the alveoli of someone with emphysema. Now this is typically caused by smoking and what happens is the alveoli walls start to break down. So instead of having millions of air sacs and alveoli in each lung, you end up with far fewer and then much larger sacs. So as a result, you have a smaller surface area for gas exchange and you're not getting enough oxygen diffusing into the lungs and enough carbon dioxide diffusing out. Last one we can see here is the normal lungs and we've got all of these here representing the alveoli and the tubes of the bronchioles. And here we have someone with pulmonary fibrosis and we can see again there's been a breakdown of those alveoli and you start to get these really thick walls as well. So the issue here is very similar. There's a smaller surface area, thicker walls, so they're not going to be able to expand as much either. So you wouldn't need to know that information off by heart, but you could be given a picture and be asked to suggest why it reduces gas exchange or maybe you'd be given data. So the last thing is data questions where you might have to interpret information looking at risk factors and lung disease. Um, it might be specifically smoking and lung disease. It could be air pollution and lung disease, um, any of those factors. And you could then have to look at a graph, which I've got in this case, or a table to answer particular questions. And the one that I'm linking it to is this. So we've got here the instance of lung cancer and it's lung cancer deaths in relation to smoking. So we've got how many people with lung cancer have died per 100,000 people and cigarettes smoked per person per year. And from this, a student concluded that the data shows the more cigarettes smoked per day will increase deaths. And your question is, do you agree? Whenever you're given a person, a student concludes, and do you agree, that is an evaluate question. So you have to use evidence from the graph that supports the conclusion and anything that doesn't provide evidence to support the conclusion. So for example, the main piece of supporting evidence is there is a positive correlation between the lung cancer deaths and cigarette smoked per year. So that does support the student's conclusion. However, so here's my um, other side of the evaluation. The data overlaps. Now you'd need to write a bit more than that. What I mean by this is, if we ever look at 2,000 to 3,500 cigarettes smoked per year, there's very, very little difference. And it does actually look like a couple of them overlap in the lung cancer deaths. So that then, if you were just to focus on these three points, there isn't actually any correlation. Um, the next thing is, there's nearly always a mark for stating, although there is a correlation, that does not prove it is the cause. So correlation does not prove causation is nearly always a mark. To give a bit more detail to that, what you would add is, it might be another factor which has caused their death. So it could actually be genetics, or maybe it's the air pollution in the location they live is really, really bad. Maybe they have another disease already. Maybe they also have emphysema or asthma. So we can't say that it is the cigarettes that definitely caused those deaths. 
The final point I've got here is there's no correlation coefficient statistic. So although we can see there is a correlation, we do not know if that correlation is significant. So that's just to give you an idea of how to structure these answers. You always need to find your supporting piece of evidence, which is normally the most obvious pattern, but then look in more detail to see information that doesn't support. And then these two final points, correlation doesn't prove causation with the extra details. And there's no statistic are always ones to consider as well. So I hope that helps you with the skills side of the gas exchange topic, as well as how you might have to apply uh, your knowledge to analyze the questions. <laughs>